I'm Jeff Alexander. I'm Chief Executive of Gatwick Diamond Business, as many of you know. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to the next in our very now well-established series of Ask the Expert um, events. It's good to see some new faces. Few too many to do individual introductions, I think, or we leap into too much of the, um, the time we've got. But we're allowing time for questions and answers at the end so you can introduce yourself, introduce yourselves properly then. So um, my job now is simply to introduce Ian McAloy and Toby, Toby Williamson, not whatever the name is on his thing, um, and to you know invite them to present to us and then to have a chat with you at the end. So the subject you know is water and the environment. I must say, sat in Broadbridge Heath, seeing water falling freely out of the sky at the moment. I really don't know what, what, what the issue is, but I'm sure we're going to learn from, uh, from Ian and Toby. So over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm, uh, I'll introduce myself first. Um, we're not going to load you with slides. Got a couple of just few stat slides about Southern Water, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the biggest challenges last summer. Uh, we'll answer Jeff's uh, point about it rains, why is there not enough, enough water, for example. We'll go through all of those things, carbon footprints, plans for the future, uh, and, and really the importance to me of you know our, our badge that we have, our brand, Water for Life. Um, there is nothing on this planet happens without water. Uh, I, I, I've, so I'm, I'm a civil and environmental engineer. I've been chief exec at Southern now for four years. I've lived and worked all around the world. Uh, I've lived in America twice um, as well. I've lived in Belgium. I've worked in Australia, the, the Middle East. Um, and one of the key things I've bring across to people is I have, this is one of the most water stress regions I've ever worked in. Um, and one of the key reasons for that is it's tiny in relative comparison to the size of its population. Uh, in this region, we, we have this constraint of 180 degrees in front of me, literally from where I live, uh, down in Hove on the coast, um, is ocean water that conventionally has not been useful for public water supply. Uh, and behind us, we have some of the most outstanding, uh, literally areas of outstanding natural beauty, uh, triple SIs, uh, and chalk streams that are among the rarest in the world. So we have a very, very precious water environment. Um, contrast it with you know, the taps and toilets of water very rarely fails in this country. Um, and people kind of, on that basis, take it for granted to some degree, we believe. It's also very cheap um, in relation to most other things, but its value is enormous. So hopefully we'll be able to talk to you about a few of those things. Um, Toby, Dr. Dr. Willison uh, is a recent joiner to the company who I am absolutely delighted and very proud to have. Um, Toby joined us from the Environment Agency where he was the Chief Operating Officer, uh, Acting Chief Exec at times as well. Brings in a, an absolute wealth of environmental experience and really part of the drive that I wanted to have in Southern Water to move us to being an environmental services company as well as a water services company as well. Toby, a few, few minutes for you to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Ian, and uh, uh, welcome, everyone, and lovely to see you all. Uh, yeah, so I've uh, last um, last 18 years uh, in the Environment Agency, as Ian said, uh, last five of those Chief Operating Officer and Chief Executive. Um, uh, but I'm, you know, the last 35 years of my career have been, uh, have all been about, uh, about the environment, whether that's been in consultancy, policy making, uh, research. Um, I spent time in uh, New Zealand, China, Japan, uh, looking at um, looking at greenhouse gas movements, and uh, uh, so I've got a you know I've got quite a broad and um, uh, I, I suppose wide ranging interest in the environment, but also experience of uh, uh, of working in the uh, in the environment. Uh, and what what attracted me to to, to Southern is pretty pretty simple actually. Uh, you know, I could see a see a company that was on the you know, on the cusp of uh, transforming. Uh, you know, in some parts of our you know our sort of geography, and we'll we'll talk a bit more about that. But particularly in our uh, you know in Hampshire, you know, we've got some we've got some challenges, which are you know the sorts of challenges that um, like geographies across the world will be facing. Uh, and I really wanted to be part of uh, you know making the making the transformation for people and communities in the uh, in the southeast 
uh, and since I was born in born in Hampshire uh, uh, and lived my early years in Hampshire, uh, you know, I feel a great great affinity for the uh, for the southeast. So, you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying that I'm either coming home or that I'm a you know I'm a sort of um, uh, without wishing to be disparaging, a sort of a tree hugger. Uh, I I do believe uh, in you know in the value of the uh, of the environment and what we pass on to on to future generations. So. And I'm dead impressed with whoever's changed the title on there. That is, uh, I, I want to know you. Um, uh, so, uh, so that's so that's uh, that's me. And I'm uh, uh, I'm just uh, I'm really interested just to get stuck into the to the questions actually because uh, you know that's where the richness of the conversation will will come. Ian, back to you. Yeah. So if I, I I'll try and. Uh, like many people in our region, and I'm in the over 55s bracket, and I've become more digitally competent. But just about to prove uh, that I'm failing at that, I'm going to try and share screen and just show you um, just a, um, a little bit. Uh, we won't bore you too much, as I say. Um, so, Southern Water. Um, this is our region. Um, it's oh goodness me. Um, so I mean about not being digitally competent. Um, we are the seventh largest water and wastewater and we are a monopoly as people know. Um, so we cover that region all the way across from Hampshire right the way out um, to the furthest reaches of Kent. Um, we have 2.6 million water customers, 4.7 million wastewater customers. And you might ask the question why. Um, this region is very peculiar in that it has a very large number of inset water only companies, um, kind of a legacy from the, the, the privatization area, era. So we, we have a continuous uh, wastewater geography and a very fragmented water geography in this region. So we have, alongside us, we have Portsmouth, we have Southeast Water, Sutton and East Surrey, Affinity Water, uh, Thames Water, Wessex, all contributing to, to this region which makes it more complicated to actually deliver some of the, um, the, the, the water services. Um, just some rough ideas of what we do, a regulated capital value of about 5.1, probably closer to 6 billion now. Um, we have a, an extensive water metering in this region, which is really good. That was put in place because of the water stress. Uh, and that will give you some idea of um, just what we, what we put into service. So every single day we put about 542 million liters of water into supply in our region um, and we treat take away about 745 million liters of wastewater so the, the the gap there is the contribution made by the water only companies um, another um, really interesting if I could get to it I'm, I'm not sure I, I will be able to um, I had another slide that was trying to get to um, let me just see if I can pull this one up I think I can. Um, people often think um, of um, the water utility companies as being the everything to do with water. And, and we currently in this region, we have some big issues in and around nitrates, for example, where we're seeing uh, near shore waters being nitrified to the point of eutrophication. It's just a, a relatively startling fact uh, in terms of how much contribution comes from water utility. So if we looked at Langston Harbour, Chichester Harbour, for example, people naturally assume that all of the nitrates come from the wastewater treatment works. But the reality of that situation is quite different. So if you look at um, Langston Harbour, for example, there's only 4% of nitrates comes from the discharges from wastewater treatment works. So it shows um, something that we're going to go on to talk about. Um, we need to think about doing water in a very, very different way from how we've done it before. It's becoming much more of a system of systems approach, catchment based, farming based, uh, agri water, uh, recycled water, thinking about it very differently because those other places in the world that I mentioned that I've lived, um, for example, in Colorado, um, you can't go to a municipal space anywhere in Colorado. Golf course is probably the best example that is irrigated, fed by drinking water. Just an, it would be a non-starter of a thought for people to say, we'll take a precious drinking water and we'll put it on municipal land, golf courses, for example. So recycled water in those parts of the world that have been more water scarce than us in the past is a reality. 
uh, and something that we're very keen in terms of exploring as we start to design our future asset base, um, we start to design more natural based solutions into it as well. Um, capital value, abandon it. Um, sewers have a 200 year asset life. Um, you know, so we can't just throw them away and say we're going to do something completely different. So one of the big parts that Toby and I are working on is, is how do we create that adaptive pathway towards a, a sustainable water future for this region? Um, the good news is it's very doable. Um, we need to just think about it and, and, and engage with people like yourselves to, to bring agri, water, industry, water utilities to bear. So a couple of other interesting points. Um, COVID-19 has massively changed how we are doing water just now. So if you think about it, um, so many people who used to commute into London who during the day were Thames Waters water customers are now at home constantly. Um, you know, so we are seeing a massively different demand profile. So at times in the summer when we got up to that higher temperature and everybody was at home, our 545 was becoming 650, 700. We put a massive stretch on our ability to actually produce water fast enough to cope with demand. Um, other areas of that, um, if we look at investment over the last 30 years, I'm sure some of you might be old enough to remember, but we used to be known as the dirty man of Europe um, with regard to our bathing waters. There's been massive investment in that. Um, and one of the things I think I've discussed previously with Jeff, um, we do willingness to pay with our customers and some were getting a bit reluctant to invest more in, in wastewater treatment and further cleanup. Um, but the reality of it, looking at the benefits that it brings, there's about 1.2 billion pounds a year that comes into our economy from people who come down from London and other places to avail themselves of our water landscapes and our utility of water as opposed to water utilities. So they don't pay bills to Southern Water. They're not really interested in their taps and toilets. They're very interested in their bathing beaches. They're very interested in their chalk streams or areas of outstanding natural beauty and how that whole water environment works. So that's a, it's a key point of where, where we're going. Um, and Toby will talk more about that. There's other two interesting facts. Uh, when we look at energy and water, energy, agri nexus, um, the water industry consumes about 3% of UK energy production. It's quite heavy uh, on consumption because the, the, the simple fact of the matter is water itself is heavy uh, and to move it around involves a lot of pumping, uh, which is expensive. So the concepts of national grid and, you know, my, my homeland sending all the water down to, to England, which, by the way, I think is a, is a remote possibility in the first place for most of them up there. Um, but it's a very expensive option and, and moving water around has real implications for water quality, natural environment, non-native invasive species. So that very simplistic answer of just moving it from one place to another is quite complicated. And then finally, I talked about the value of water versus the cost. Um, it really staggers people, I think. And we had this question with a customer recently who was talking about, well, why wouldn't I can buy a litre of bottled water in a supermarket for 17p? So why wouldn't I just use that to wash dishes and so on? Well, the answer is, I don't know if you're aware, most of you probably will be, but to fill that litre bottle up with tap water would cost 0.0001p. Um, you know, it's a massive, massive difference. And therefore we have this, this real dilemma for us where water is incredibly cheap. Now, not for everyone, because 360, 400 pounds a year is a lot for some people. I come from a a very, very working class background in Scotland. That's a lot of money for some people. Um, we accept that and we understand that. So helping people who find affordability a challenge is, is absolutely one of our aims. But for the vast majority of people, the bigger majority of people, water is cheap. And therefore it creates a dilemma in the human condition is such that what is cheap and plentiful and available, we tend not to think about very much. So that's you know something we've been really keen to engage with you today. So I've talked enough, Toby, over to you on some of the environmental stuff. Thanks, Ian. Um, so I'm going to start just by talking about some of the challenges that we all collectively face, um, uh, and then I'll talk about you know a little bit about how you know how we're rising to those challenges at, uh, at Southern, and maybe it'll give you some uh, give you some food for thought. 
So there, you know, there, there, there is a fierce truth that there are, you know, there are two major challenges that are facing us. Uh, you know, I think particularly in the southeast, but across across society, which are, you know, the combination of population growth, uh, and we know that, uh, you know, over the uh, over the coming decades, uh, the population in the southeast is likely to grow by about four million. Um, uh, so that, you know, by the middle of this century. Probably half the half the drinking water uh, consumed in the uh, uh, in England and Wales will be consumed in the uh, in the southeast, uh, and climate change, uh, and and the combination of the tr the two presents all of us with some uh, with some real uh, some real challenges, uh, and we've seen the we've seen the impacts of uh, of climate change. Um, you know, when I started uh, when I started my research career. Um, uh, I published in about the um, 88, 89, something like that. Uh, you know, the first uh, first national um, uh, methane budget for the for the UK, uh, and we used to talk in uh, equivalents of carbon dioxide, which uh, people still do. Uh, uh, and we, 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 I was quoting um, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations globally as 372 parts per million. Uh, they're currently at 413 parts per million, uh, and pre-industrialization were about 270 parts per million, uh, and that is an, an ex inexorable uh, increase that is that is driven by uh, by our activities, uh, and we see the we see the manifestation of that. You know, we've just had you know the wettest uh, uh, you know the wettest uh, wettest February in uh, uh, 2020. Um, you know, we've literally just had the the coldest day in the uh, in the UK in uh, in 60 years. Uh, you know, the, the 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 driest May on record. You know, virtually you know a month, a year, a week doesn't go by when you know there isn't some uh, some manifestation of carb uh, of climate change, uh, and we're all having to you know we're all having to deal with that. Now, for us in uh, in in southern water, uh, you know that is uh, that is largely um, uh, manifest in you know the services we provide, but also the resilience of our of our infrastructure. So we're not only having to deal with a large population uh, with a, uh, a pressure on uh, the water that we take from the environment to provide for customers. Uh, we're also having to deal with the you know, with the impacts of climate change on our uh, on our asset base, you know, on the uh, you know on the works that are you know uh, producing uh, drinking water and on our works that are treating um, you know, wastewater. Now, just to give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of context, the average annual rainfall uh, of the UK is about eight hundred and eighty five, eight hundred and ninety uh, millimeters a year. Uh, in Gatwick, it is uh, 608 uh, millimetres a year, uh, which is broadly the same as Jerusalem. Uh, so, you know, as, as Ian said, we might think of the think of the UK as being wet and we joke about the weather. But actually, uh, you know, in the southeast, we are uh, we are a very dry environment uh, and we're an environment, as Ian says, is wholly or not wholly, but is largely dependent on. Uh, aquifers, groundwater sources for our uh, for our water, uh, for our drinking water, uh, and that is uh, you know the water that is also providing you know for some really important uh, habitats, um, you know whether those are, whether those are chalk streams, uh, whether those are the you know the downlands, uh, you know these are these are all you know massively uh, important uh, environments to uh, to the communities that live in them and also importantly to the economies that are based on the tourists that come to uh, come to use that you, know, you uh, come to visit the south southeast so you know there's um, you know there is a there is a really uh, there is a real challenge in there uh, for for all of us so what are we so what are we we trying to trying to do about it so there's a uh, there's the things that we're doing with our own uh, with our own business. So, you know, dealing with climate change is so it's a product of two things. It's a product of, you know, the amount of carbon that's uh, going into the atmosphere, uh, and it's a product of how we respond to the carbon that is already in the atmosphere. So even if by some sort of you know miraculous intervention of policy and technology and whatever else. 
even if we were globally able to stop emitting carbon to the atmosphere now, right now, there is still you know one and a half degrees of uh, increase in our uh, in our climate in our temperature that is already baked in because of carbon that we have already emitted to the to the atmosphere. That is going to that is going to happen. Uh, the the challenge for us is the extent to to, to which we uh, we reduce uh, the carbon that's going into the atmosphere. So that's you know that's net zero, uh, and and I would expect that all of us are trying to do things that are reducing our our carbon footprint. So for us in uh, us in Southern, for example, you know we've taken the decision you know relatively recently uh, that we're going to you know get all of our uh, all of our energy from uh, from green sources. Now, as Ian said, we're a massive massive energy user. Uh, you know, we spend tens of millions a year uh, on uh, on energy, um, but in a uh, you know in a swipe we can we can reduce our our carbon footprint by forty five percent by by doing that. When we then look at you know things like you know actually how we operate our our assets, um, the embedded carbon in the uh, in in the in the infrastructure that we build, you know there is then you know there are then other uh, other things that we can do to further reduce that that carbon footprint, and we are confident that by 2030, you know, we will be at uh, we will be at net zero. Um, but that won't come without uh, cost, effort, uh, and uh, changing the mindset of you know uh, our customers uh, and our uh, and the and the people in our in our organisation. So that's our that's our bit to you know if you like. Um, uh, you know, reduce our our carbon impact on the uh, on the environment, and then there are the things that we're doing to um, to respond to the climate change that is already, uh, as I said, already baked in, uh, and that's about you know looking at the resilience of our assets. Uh, it's about looking at where our where our assets are, and it's about looking at different ways of managing the water cycle so that it is more sustainable. So at the moment, you know, as Ian said, people turn on their taps, they, uh, you know, they flush the flush the loo, and largely, uh, you know, don't think too much about either, you know, where their where their water is coming from, or the systems that are responsible for both the production of that water and the and the quality of that that water, um, uh, and that water comes from the comes from the environment, and it is the product of. Um, Human activity, uh, land land management, uh, you know how we all behave in the uh, in the environment. It's a product of the you know the the, the 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 soils, the geology. There are a whole range of factors that go into uh, you know what the what the quality of that that water is. And we are you know southern water, just one point in that uh, in that cycle where we intervene by taking water out. It gets used. Get we treat it and it gets gets put back in and the solutions to having long term sustainable water are actually not in fiddling with uh, that little interface between the company and the water cycle the solutions are about how we all uh, interface with that with that water cycle uh, and in particular uh, there are you know some some key um, uh, Bodies, organisations, actors who are you know who are critical in that uh, uh, in that cycle. So la land landowners and land users. So the agricultural community and the land owning community. Uh, you know, agriculture plays a huge role uh, in both uh, the amount of water that is uh, available uh, for public use and available for. Uh, you know the environment, uh, but also the quality of that that water as well, because we know that um, you know through decades of research that you know agricultural activities release nutrients uh, into the environment, uh, into the atmosphere. Um, you know, and poultry, pigs, cattle, sheep, uh, you know, do all the things that we do, uh, except they don't flush the toilet, and that that all goes into the goes into the environment as well. So in in a place like Hampshire, for example, where you know we've got a you know a huge uh, hugely important uh, environment in the test and itching and those those chalk streams uh, and we face a you know, a big big challenge in the you know water water availability um uh you know we are looking at how we 
uh, operate with landowners, with uh, planning authorities, with with businesses, um, you know, with 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 politicians, and also most importantly with customers to ensure that you know we are taking the right steps to uh, ensure that there is long term sustainable water uh, in uh, in Hampshire. And Hampshire will be just a you know a, a subset of uh, you know many other uh, like places around the around the country and uh, and in, and indeed in uh, in in Surrey and Sussex. So what sort of things are we doing in Hampshire? So we are looking at uh, infrastructure investment. So we're we're looking at uh, options like uh, desalination. Uh, you know, so taking taking seawater, treating it, stripping stuff out, putting some stuff back in, and putting it into the uh, into the public water supply. Uh, we're looking at water recycling. Uh, so you know, instead of processing uh, wastewater, producing a uh, a final treated effluent that then goes into the environment, taking that final treated effluent and putting it back into the uh, into the water system. Now, on one level, customers have a sort of um, you know, a visceral oh, so I don't like that type of reaction to that, but. In, in actual fact, it is no different to you know growing up um, as I did for you know my later part of my youth um, uh, in Berkshire, uh, and, and knowing that you know the water on the Thames had been you know the, it was drunk seven times before it got to me. That was what was that was what was regularly said to me. And there is you know there is no new water uh, in the environment, so you know it is all just cycling around. So water recycling is uh, is an important part of the solution. Then working with working with farmers, so that you know the you know the sorts of catchment based approaches that um, you know fencing fencing watercourses where you put um, uh, water feed uh, water butts where you where you feed animals, all of that you know, is relatively low cost and relatively simple, but has a massive impact on uh, on water water quality. So how do we you know how do we work with with farmers, uh, and then uh, and then customers. So, uh, you know, currently, as Ian said, we have, you know, the highest level of meter penetration in the uh, in the country in the southeast. Uh, we have the uh, the lowest average per capita consumption of about 129 uh, litres per person per day compared to a national average of about 145, 47, something like that. Um, we, we want to get down to uh, 100 litres per person per day because the you know the the, the 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 less we're using the less we're putting into the system the more resilient the the system is and we believe that 100 is you know really uh, attainable because we know that a lot of uh, individuals a lot of families are already at that that level and actually there are um, there are also uh, you know, a subset of what you might term super users who who use considerably more than uh, you know 129 and this is about you know getting those super users down to uh, you know a level that bring, brings the average uh, you know down to down to 100 and that will have a that will have a massive impact uh, and then there are the things that policymakers can do as well so you know Ian and I have been having um, well, we had one earlier today actually we, we, we are regularly having uh, conversations with politicians ministers about the you know the interventions that uh, the policymakers can make so water labeling for for example um, you know you wouldn't go and buy a buy an electrical item without knowing you know where it comes on the um, you know, electrical efficiency energy efficiency you know why isn't that standard for for water as well I mean we know that in other parts of the world that's had a major impact on uh, uh, you know water usage um, you know that should be the sort of thing that you know is standard in uh, in this country you know why aren't, why aren't all houses that are built uh, water efficient we expect them to be energy efficient why don't we expect them to be Water efficient as well. Uh, you know, we're in one of the you know most certainly water stressed parts of this country, and one of the most water stressed parts of uh, of Northern Europe. Why you know why isn't that just standard? So you know we're having these um, you know these conversations with 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 policymakers as well, uh, and then the, and then developers. Um, you know where where houses are built, the planning decisions that uh, that local authorities make, how we uh, you know how we help to. You know, shape those decisions in such a way that are uh, that are sustainable. Now, all of that, you know, fa fantastically, uh, fantastically good. Uh, you know, we have 
you know huge aspirations in this uh, in this space. Um, but why does it matter to you know to the person on the on on the street? You know why you know why should why should our customers? Why should you know employees in your your companies be be worried about this? Well, because the you know the counter the counterfactual is that uh, you know there isn't enough water, so we have to spend as a society you know huge amount producing water in uh, you know very expensive uh, very expensive ways. Now whether that's building you know more reservoirs, whether that's building more pipes, whether that's expending more carbon, you know all of the things that that actually we know have a you know, have a detrimental effect on the environment and the, uh, and have a cost associated with them, but we also know that uh, you know by building more sustainable uh, you know water solutions, water futures, that actually we sustain uh, we sustain our environment as well. We sustain habitats, we sustain biodiversity, uh, and it, we increasingly know from our customers that, that really really matters to them. Uh, and I think we've all seen during the during the last twelve months the uh, the value that people attach to their uh, to their local uh, to their local environment, you know, to their local their local park, their local nature reserve, the place they brought their dogs, where they're able to take their kids to kids to play, and um, and we're you know so we're we're all operating in this uh, this integrated uh, this integrated system. So whilst we're hugely ambitious about uh, you know the carbon that we put into the atmosphere, how we operate our assets, how we're prepared for climate change, uh, how we're um, uh, influencing our customers, we're also hugely ambitious to be you know working you know even more closely with wildlife trusts, with rivers trusts uh, to in to develop ideas where uh, we can demonstrate the value of nature-based solutions. So, you know, whether it's catchment-based uh, uh, approaches to improving river water quality, uh, whether it's um, uh, you know increasing wetlands, uh, uh, improved water storage, you know, these types of things which have benefits for our business, have benefits for consumers, but also uh, um, be benefit the benefit the environment in its uh, in its wider uh, in its wider sense. So we'll be you know, we will be building a um, you know a a network of uh, you know projects and programs with uh, let's say with wildlife trust with rivers trust with ENGOs to you know uh, explore even further how we uh, how we do that because we believe that it you know, benefits us benefits the uh, communities and benefits the economy of the uh, of the southeast. Now, one last thing that I'm going to uh, just leave you with, which um, uh, I know Ian is uh, Ian is passionate about, um, uh, and, and you may think, well, why is this why is this relevant in sort of Gatwick? We're not we're not close to the close to the coast, but I want to talk to you about the kelp forest. So the kelp forest is uh, it's a near shore, um, uh, basically seaweed seaweed habitat. Um, uh, and it's massively important because it's the it's a breeding ground for you know lots of fish. Uh, it's where our decimated seahorse population um, uh, comes from, uh, and it is potentially uh, a really important uh, mechanism to take carbon out of the atmosphere. There's some evidence that kelp is five times more effective than than trees. Uh, and it also takes nutrients out of the uh, out of the environment as well. So you you potentially, if you um, if you nurture your kelp forest, you get uh, carbon wins, you get biodiversity wins, um, but 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 also uh, you, you know you get you get other you get other benefits as well. You get reduced reduced flood risk because you take energy out of the uh, out of the out of the waves, but. Those those kelp forests have been decimated by um, you know, decades of um, uh, uh, subsurface trawling. So you know there is a, a proposition in front of the Secretary of State at the moment mm -hmm. to for a bylaw to to stop that on the uh, on the Sussex coast. Uh, you know that would have you know if that if that if that happens that would be just massively um, uh, important for um, uh, you know for. Uh, for the environment for Sussex. Now, why does it matter to you? Well, it matters to you because you know 
those are the sorts of things that are going to bring more and more people to the to the southeast and the, you know we know that the ripple effects the the economic ripple effects of you know things like that happening in our uh, you know in our um uh, in our lo in our locality uh, have a really have a really big impact so you know it, it is it is wrong to think about um and I know we don't, but you know, it's wrong to think about you know, the environment in isolation from business, in isolation from the economy, in isolation from from communities. All these things are uh, all these things are joined up. And actually, the challenge for all of us is in creating the um, you know the bandwidth, the intellectual capacity, the you know the the knowledge within our businesses to you know bring those bring those things together to understand actually. Where is it that we make the optimal decisions that have you know, an economic benefit, have an environmental benefit and have a, uh, you know, have a social benefit? Uh, and increasingly, as um, uh, ESG reporting, if that means anything to you, but increasingly as that, as that becomes uh, you know, uh, uh, more legislatively based and driven by regulation, uh, you know, it will be forcing all of us to think much more in that, uh, in that way. Okay. Anyway, I think I have spoken for far longer than I intended to, and I am, no, I, you, am, you, I, am you. I am eating into valuable uh, inquisition time. You've left us a good twenty minutes, so that's great. So, so, so thanks, Toby, and uh, and thanks, Ian. Uh, we will get straight into questions. To begin with, I'm going to uh, turn to questions that people have posted on in, in chat, but invite individuals to ask the questions themselves because that's much more much more personal. And we're going to kick off with um, Anya, who has a question on net zero, which may have been answered to some extent, but I'm sure Anya will develop it. Um, hi, both. So very interesting talk. Thank you very much. My name is Anya Ledwith. I'm an environmental management consultant. Um, everybody's talking about net zero in terms of reducing their carbon emissions, mm. but I was, I was really interested to hear how energy intensive the water industry is from from pump uh, from pumping and when I do carbon footprinting actually water consumption and, and um, sewage is actually very low on people's carbon footprints usually but um, what advice would you give to businesses particularly about uh, reducing their carbon emissions from an energy efficient uh, sorry from a water efficiency point of view and do you push your message Rather than just saving water, do you do you link it to the net zero campaign? Do you wanna, I mean, I can talk yeah, about the practicalities. Do you want to talk about the link to net zero? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in terms of, uh, uh, so the first thing I'd say to say to any business is, um, you know, just know no no know where your carbon is, uh, <laughs> know know where your know where your energy go is going, know where you're expending it, know where you're getting it, know where you're getting it from, uh, and and know where your uh, where your biggest losses losses are, because uh, in doing that, I I can almost guarantee you will drive um, uh, you know financial sustainability into your business as well as uh, as well as uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Um, then, then in terms of uh, in terms specifically of water, um, uh, so when uh, so going going back to the going back to my environment agency days. So when I was chief operating officer, uh, one of the things that we did was we we looked at um, you know all of our uh, water usage at all of our at all of our sites uh, and did a Ian, close your ears about this, but you know we 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 did we did audits of um, you know uh, potential leakage, uh, you know, and we found uh, you know a lot of leakage at our own uh, at our own sites that we you know we then had to that we then had to deal with. Um, now you might think, well, surely to goodness the Environment Agency would have done that decades ago, uh, and that is a perfectly good good challenge. But I can guarantee that if if we haven't done it, then there are you know a whole bunch of businesses who haven't done it as well. So that sort of auditing type of approach, deal with the deal with the hygiene factors, then look at you know the sort of um, you know the sort of kit that you're sort of kit that you're using, uh, and try and find the stuff that is. You know, whatever your whatever your business is, the stuff that is most uh, you know, most water uh, and energy efficient as uh, uh, as possible. 
Ian, do you want to add to that? Well, I think that, 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 that's key. And the other aspect is heating. Uh, uh, large percentages of water are heated uh, in businesses uh, and homes as well. Uh, and, and, and heating too much is, a, is quite a big carbon draw. Uh, so actually, it, stopping wastage, using what you need, using it wisely rather than just the wastage. Um, you can cut both your water consumption and your energy consumption as well, which is good for the customer, uh, but also very good for the environment too. So there's a host of water efficient devices. Water labeling is something that we have and I can turn to one of the questions about households. Um, work in Australia has demonstrated that water labeling of white goods, water consumptive goods is the biggest reduction of all. Um, so having water efficient goods is, is really a big step forward as well. Um, so making sure that you are buying water efficient, the best water efficiency, because we've got the labels for energy efficiency, why not for water? Um, so that, that was demonstrating in Australia as having the biggest impact of all. Thanks, I just want to group a couple of questions so we can get through as many as we can. So Nick Swan, who if he was speaking himself would declare interest, but he asks, um, what percentage of water production is consumed by drinking? And if everyone drank tap water and there was no bottled water sales, would there be enough to fulfill demand? And just link, sort of link to that because it's to do with consumption. Jeff Downs uh, picks up a question on how is water meter installation progressing? So if you'd like to take those, you can probably see the questions in chat yourself, but if you'd like to pick up on those two. Do you want to pick up on the first one? Yeah. Wife's decided to dice and just now let me just close the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, ap my apologies uh, the, the issues of working from home and um, toby i can i can pick up on the you know so a really bold decision was made by my predecessor on water metering because we are a water stress region so we are we're about 88 percent on water meterage cover um so i actually had a question to ask back to everybody of for those that have got water meters do you know what your consumption is um, because it's, um, we do get people that speak to us about our bills, but actually your bill is only a constituent of your consumption. So if that information is available, what, what more can we do to make it that people will talk to us about, uh, about consumption? And then turning to the drinking water, well, if, we, if we're at an average of 128 uh, litres per head per day, the average person will consume roughly two sometimes up to five litres of water per day. So drinking it is by far the smallest proportion. Flushing it down the toilet uh, is the biggest proportion, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, so for those at home, we always uh, preach the mantra of the, uh, I, I saw the, the, the ick question, but uh, if it's yellow, let it mellow. And if it's brown, flush it down. There is no need to flush your toilet 20 times a day, especially if you have an inefficient toilet um, which is running at eight, nine, 10 litres, um, then you're very quickly going up to 200 litres per day uh, on that. So that really brings it home as to what difference a water efficient toilet would make. And then also if we had a grey water supply to toilets or captured from the gardens that someone had said, if we could capture efficiently a grey water supply, we could take all of that consumption out from toilets as well. And you, you begin to see very quickly how little things can make a really big difference. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, the other part of the question was, would oh, there yes. be enough water to go around? We, we, we don't want to scare people. There is enough water to go around, trust me. Um, okay. We just have to use it more efficiently and be more effective with it. There will always be enough water to go around. Uh, in, invention and innovation will always help us to solve that problem. Well, if we can drink the Thames seven times, then yeah, that's okay. Grouping another couple of questions related to what we've just been discussing, actually, there's one from um, Tim Parrott. Um, at, at, we're getting to the stage where you know, power generation, is, it can be done locally, even, even by house. And what Tim is suggesting, is there a point where we can actually do deal with water in a similar way? And he mentions water treatment in particular. And Dan Wood, Woodward of Rygate and, and Banstead Borough Council would be interested to learn what the experts see as the priorities for local authorities in helping to identify water as a precious resource rather than a free good and implementing water efficiency measures. So if I could group those two. I'll kick off with this one. So um, uh, 
if any of you have read Tim Peake's uh, uh, autobiography, um, you will know that on the International Space Station, there are there's an American bit of it and a, uh, and a Russian bit of it. Uh, and on the American bit of it, uh, all uh, urine is captured, um, uh, totally recycled, and goes back for the um, astronauts to drink. Uh, if you're... Uh, using toilet the toilet on the russian side of it uh your urine is collected and taken back to um taken back to earth for 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 treatment so you know in many respects the technology is uh you know is out there and is uh and is improving uh you know will will it will it get to a house by house basis uh you know anytime soon uh, i doubt but as the question uh, as Patrick is is alluding to, there are masses of things that we can all do that are going to take the pressure off our you know domestic domestic systems. Just just relatively simple things like water butts, you know, collecting collecting rainwater off your off your roofs and using it to wash your cars, water your garden, water your house plants. So things like that, which are you know really relatively low cost actually actually have a you know surprisingly big um big impact so you know there's stuff like stuff like that that really really matters um then then to go on to uh you know local local authorities you know they clearly have you know a huge um you know a huge role in uh, in planning uh, and particularly in the management of surface water so we know that uh, you know surface water runoff, um, particularly during uh, you know rainfall events, puts a massive pressure uh, on the sewerage system where you have that sort of combined uh, um, uh, foul and surface water systems together. Um, you know, in uh, in planning decisions, uh, in enforcing uh, you know planning planning regulations, and in developing solutions like. Suds, so sustainable ur urban drainage systems, and in you know maintaining those those suds, uh, uh, local authorities have a huge huge role to play in uh, in taking the pressure off the off the system, which then has a you know a hugely beneficial uh, impact on the uh, on the environment as well. But you know in virtually all of this, whether it's individual domestic um, properties or whether it's sort of large scale community community planning, you know. We've got to be better at learning from from others. You know, Ian's talked about his experiences around the, around the world, but we've got mm -hmm. to you know we've got to sort of get that get get, get that thinking, get that learning, get, just steal it with pride from others. Just do that, you know, far far quicker than we are, uh, I think, um, culturally uh, um, used to. Yeah, and if I, if I could add to that just briefly, um, technology will be part of the answer, undoubtedly. Um, you know, water uh, has not been at the forefront of the agenda because previously it's not been an issue. I, I listened uh, very briefly to Jeff Gates Foundation talk this morning where 30% of the world is now out of water. Um, that will drive, necessity will drive that invention. So one of the things that I hope I brought to Southern is encouraging our people to stop looking at ourselves and go elsewhere in the world and find out where technology is advancing, which is really important. In the household side of it, Yes, there will come a day when we have household treatment plants. They are already there for some houses, new builds, and they're already there in Australia, for example. Um, one of the biggest issues, though, with water is um, its quality. And your in-house treatment plant is only as good as the maintenance that you apply to it uh, and the quality testing that you do for it. So it will not become a panacea very quickly because the, you know there is the ability, particularly drawing from ground sources, uh, to bring in a lot of contaminants to the water system what needs to be very properly treated out. So I think that everything is a balance. Uh, we have to move the balance more to actually decentralised scale um, and making sure that there is more localised approach. And the last part of that is water butts. People care about water mostly when there's too little or too much. Water butts can actually be used as part of a flood protection system. So you can have smarts on your water butt that if we know torrential rain is coming because we're seeing more and more of that you can have a system that actually empties your water butt when it's dry and then your water butt is a flood protection system when the, the intense rainfall comes it's just more holistic thinking more joining the system of systems i think okay thanks i'm going to ask um uh, nigel you'd like to ask a <clears throat> follow-up question on 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 metering so over to you 
Nigel. I suspect from an innovation perspective, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, very you? there you are. There you are, Nigel. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, Nigel Lamb from the Sussex Innovation Centre. Um, I guess the combination of meter technology and a bit of nudge economics in there as well is that if you look at the experience of electricity meters, we had them for years and they had no impact until somebody went mad when the bill turned up. And I feel the kind of water metering is in the same position. But what's happened in, in certainly my house, I'm sure most houses, now when you have a, a, a in kitchen display showing you live readouts of actually what electricity has been used, all of a sudden everyone's conscious of it and actually it does change behaviours and it does re reduce usage. Is there a thought to actually try to put that same technology into houses that people can see live actually consumption to change behaviours? Because as I say, certainly in our house, it's, it's only for the 20 minutes after the bill arrives that, you know, you really think about, we better change this, and then you get busy and you, and you move on. So I don't know if you could use more technology in that way. I, I think so. Absolutely. And, and, and one of the... One of the hindrances we, that we actually have, having been the first company to put all the water metering in, is we have first generation water meters. Um, so they are far from smart, let's be really clear. But, the, you know, so the opportunity comes as we move them on. Um, but actually, I'm starting to see technology that just does it in-house. So you can have tape now that can measure every, every water device in your house has an acoustic signal. Um, so it, a, a truly smart system that isn't just the tachograph and myelometer um, or speedometer rally. Um, every, a truly smart system will be looking at bringing the energy and the water together. So when is the right time to heat your water? Um, it will just get done automatically for you in the future. When's the right time to switch from your solar um, to your ground heat to your grid uh, produced power? How do we get that balance? How does your house actually truly become smart of knowing when to draw water, when to draw power, or when to actually put it back into the grid. You know, that's that's the smart world for me that I think is really exciting because we can't kid ourselves. You you obviously know and you do a lot of this. Customers are not going to spend all the time looking at that meter. It's just not going to happen. So we're going to have to automate it more. <clears throat> I think where we do have an opportunity is that, that real true connection of water as holistic and being very connected to the environment, both in terms of its source and where it gets distributed to as well. And trying to bring customers more into that emotional connection to water, because the cost, you know, if I tell you that you can save two pounds a year um, by using your water differently, I'm not sure you're gonna get desperately excited. Um, if I tell you that you can help the environment significantly and all the environmental net gain in carbon, maybe we're in a different place. So it'd be good to speak about, you know, how do we get our smarts to actually talk about things that truly interest customers and engage them? Thanks. Tony Darton, who unfortunately has had to leave, asked an inter interesting question uh, to do with new development. You know, new development is a huge issue in our region. And, and I think the gist of the question is, are we making most of the opportunity of new development in order to, you know, to bring in not just energy efficiency, but water and waste efficiency? So lots of the things we've discussed, ideal opportunity when we develop new stuff, but are we taking advantage yeah. of that? Um, partially. Um, so I don't like absolutes when everybody goes, no, we're not. Yes, we are. No, partially. Um, but there's a massive opportunity to do more. Um, you know, so really, um, if, if we are in that water stress area, let, let's just get the, the water labeling done, regardless of whether central government has said it's part of it. You know, we can mandate that. And, and builders will are starting to come to this as well. They're realizing that it's actually a sell for some of their customers, um, as long as it's not adding cost, which now that these devices are becoming more frequent, it's not adding cost. So I, I think there's an opportunity to do more. The difficulty we have, once that house is built, it's there for 200 years. So if we build it, we, you know, the builders see houses, Toby and I see an asset in our hydraulic system. You know, so we want to make sure the assets we connect to our system are as efficient as possible right now. So I really encourage people to do as much as we possibly can is, the, is, is my honest response to that. Thanks Ian. Um, just, just to mention that um, Louise from Sussex Wildlife Trust has um, posted some interesting connections to the kelp, the kelp forest issue, which is, seems to have really captured people's imagination. Yeah. Um, I want to finish, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Sally to ask. Sally has posted an incredible question about Russian urine, but I think, I think I'm going to ask her to ask that. <laughs> Sally, over to you. I'll, 
I'm both impressed and amazed. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you just um, where Toby was saying about um, best practice and, and, and stealing people's ideas with pride. Why the American and Russians haven't shared the uh, urine uh, recycling method? <laughs> You'll have to ask them, Sally, but I suspect it's probably got something to do with, uh, you know, U US and Russian Russian relations in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. Time <laughs> to move on, I think, isn't it, for them? No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sally, if I can add to it, it, it is one of our challenges. You know, Britain has led the way in water for many, many years, uh, many decades, if not centuries. Um, others, others are now because of necessity driving to that place. And I have seen it in my own organisation, the not invented here syndrome. Mm. We need to get over ourselves yeah. as a nation, as a set of engineers, as a set of human beings. Um, not invented here is not applicable to the future. So Toby and I are very clear. We will steal anybody's good idea, copy it, try and make it better. And if we have made it better, we'll share it on as well. Excellent. So, good for you. I think that's part of it. <laughs> Thank you. That, 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 that's been great. And just to finish on a, on a positive note, as it's international rugby season, there used to be a joke going around Cardiff that on international day, if you had a few too many pints of brains dark and fell into the taff, the issue was, would you drown or dissolve first? Yet now, it, now the taff is a good fishing river again. So that's, so that's, that's progress. Yeah. Um, so really, just 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 to thank you both. That that's been really excellent. You've seen the level of interest you've generated and the informed questions. I think that's been a really good session. So if we could just finish off with a round of applause for Ian and Toby, please. A virtual, well, not a real round of applause. And at exactly twelve o'clock, prompt if nothing else. Good to see you all, and see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. Much Thanks. appreciated. Right. Thank you.